Good morning. Thank you for, for coming. And uh, thank you for my host for inviting me to uh, the university here. So I've been given the task to try and explain everything that happens in the materials department in Cambridge. And in quite a short time, that's quite difficult. So I'm going to try to cover, go from the operation of the department as a whole within the university. And I will finish by talking about a little bit about my own research, which is really the only thing I know very much about. So um, the, the three things I'm going to try to talk about are, uh, firstly, what we mean by material science in Cambridge and what the department does by way of research. Um, the department's future and the Department of Material Studies generally depends on what we do now, the, the areas that we study, and what we can do in the future. And then I'm going to talk a little bit, before I talk about my own research, about what I think is the future for materials departments. So this is, this is a photograph of Cambridge. So this is uh, the building that used to house my laboratory until three years ago. Uh, it was built in the 19th century, and it was not a very good place to do modern research. Um, in the 1970s, a new part of the department was, was built, uh, which was even worse. So the, the structure was, was terrible. Um, but we were lucky. So this is, this is Cambridge. So Cambridge is a, is a pretty small city. It is about five kilometers across. Um, and so this is where we were before in, in the center of Cambridge. This is our current location now. So three kilometers for, for Cambridge is a big distance, but it's, um, you can go by bicycle from here to here in about 10 minutes. So Cambridge is a really tiny city. Um, this is the new department. So it is purpose built for material science, which is the first time that's happened uh, in Cambridge. And some history, so I, I know a bit about the history of, of this institution. So it started as a department of metallurgy sometime in the 1920s. And this is what the department of metallurgy looked like in 1938. So all men, all white, um, but things have changed a bit since then. So after a lot of thought, we added the word material science to the end of our official department title in 1986. And then we decided it looked better the other way around, so we changed it to the Department of Material Science and Metallurgy. Um, and that's how the department looked in 1996. So the department has, has grown a lot, and it's continued to grow since then. So this is the new department building. It is still the Department of Material Science and Metallurgy. It reflects our, our heritage. But, and we still do quite a lot of metallurgy, but uh, the material science component is gradually increasing. So there are some special features of this building, which um, Lindsay Greer, my predecessor, may have shown you previously. So there is the outside has this grain structure made in, in the brickwork. Um, and if you look on Google Earth from the top, you can see that this, this garden here, which is on top of the microscope center, also has a sort of grain structure made in plants, but it's, it's not so distinct because it, it grows. So this is the, the top of the department. So as I say, this, this area here is a specialist center for electron microscopy. So it has very, very low vibration, very low electrical noise. The rest of the department laboratories are in this, this region here. And there, within this, there is quite a large center, uh, partially funded by Rolls-Royce aero engines, for where we study high temperature alloys. So this is, this is where we are. This is the university's West Cambridge site, which you can see is, is mostly fields. Uh, this is the veterinary school. And the plans of the university are to move various departments from around Cambridge into, uh, into this region here. So physics is actually already here, but it will move to a new building in five years' time. Engineering will move from the center of Cambridge. Chemistry will move from the center of Cambridge. 
And the idea is, is probably that there will also be a lot of industrial research labs co-located on this site. But the hope is that material science remains at the centre of this activity and that we can interact not only with the other university departments, but of course with, with outside companies and sponsors. So that's the, the development of the, of the university. And we work across a very wide range of sectors, but uh, we are obviously dependent on research funding for being able to do the work that we do. So um, EPSRC is our National Research Fund Funding Council, and most of our, or the majority of our funding comes from that. Industry is quite a large component, and those of you who follow British and European politics will know that the fact that we get 33% of our funding from the European Union is, is, is not good in the sense that if, we, if that is at risk, then the department's income is going to have to fall a lot. So this is European funding. That has been guaranteed by the British government for the next three years, but beyond that, we, we literally don't know what's, what's going to happen. So this is uh, the UK funding that we, we happen to have at the moment, and you can see that uh, in fact, the largest funding comes on structural metallic systems for gas turbines. So it is uh, nickel-based super alloys for, for the high temperature stage of, of aircraft turbines. Uh, then there are, there are other grants uh, in getting smaller as you move down the list, but ranging from uh, the work I do, which is on superconducting spintronics, through to, to other steels and so on. So it, Although the department is quite small, it works across a very broad range of disciplines. As I said, we get a lot of European funding, and one of the primary sources is the European Research Council, which awards individual investigators large multi-million, these, these numbers here are, are, are in pounds. So uh, a number of department staff have these grants. They provide five years of stable funding to allow you to appoint postdocs and, and students. Um, and again, if we lose this, this is going to be serious for, for the department. So we, uh, the department as a whole is quite small. Cambridge as a university is actually quite small. We have less than 10,000 students. Uh, and of those, maybe 30 or 40 in each year will graduate in material science. So this is the total undergraduate numbers across four years. And you can see there's been a big change. And again, these were changes put in place by my predecessor, that we've moved from a really rather low number to almost tripling that, so that the numbers of students have, have gone up dramatically. But they are still small numbers. And the Cambridge education system is is based around individual small group tuition. So the students get direct access to faculty staff for teaching throughout their time in Cambridge. Um, so almost everything in the UK is now measured in some way or another. So there is a thing called the National Student Survey where students have to rate the courses that they, they are taking. And this is this year's uh, report. So this is, the, these, these bars are the material science department in Cambridge. These, these blue uh, marks here are the, are the performance of all the other departments in Cambridge averaged together. And this is the, the overall sector of material science across uh, the UK. And we think this is pretty good. 100% of our students are satisfied with what we teach them. So um, we, we think this is good, and indeed, by most measures, we, we perform better than most uh, Cambridge departments and across the board. So uh, students and student welfare is, is very important, and equally important is finding some method by which we can measure how well we do our research and how, in particular, whether that research that we do actually has external impact because it's obviously possible to spend your life in a laboratory doing research, writing papers, and those papers are never read, they're never cited. So 
uh, the, the impact is important, and then the strategy for developing that then becomes even more important. So I guess a lot of you are involved in, in research in, in one way or another, so you need to ask the question of how good is your research how do you, and how do you measure that? So here are three possible methods of measuring it. So citation data, so I write a paper, someone else uh, refers to it in their paper, that gets me one citation. Is that good? It's, it's, it's a measure of performance, but it's weighted very strongly to work which leads to scientific breakthroughs, not the development of uh, materials for a particular application. So in a material science context, citation data is questionable as a measure of, of research performance. Grant income is important. As head of department, I, I, money is, is extremely important. But, but of course, how much money you get depends on the country you work in, whether it's a large amount or a small amount, is, is difficult to understand internationally. And then the last measure, which is favored by the UK government at the moment, is impact. And you, they are trying to measure impact. So every five years, UK research departments are assessed by something which is called uh, the Research Excellence Framework. So it is a national competition which rates the performance, research performance of departments. And this is important because it is translated back into money that we get from central government. So it is important that the, the university performs well and the departments performed well. So each uh, department is, is, goes into what is called a unit of assessment. And last time we were in this composite assessment panel of electrical and electronic engineering together with materials and metallurgy. So a lot of things go into this, this submission. So research outputs are basically papers. So each member of staff submits four papers, which they think are their best papers. Um, but then this, this impact stuff is, is important because it determines whether your research has been taken up in some way. There's something about the environment, so are research students uh, well supported? And is the department recognized in terms of prizes and awards? Okay, so we do well. We have always come, as a department, we've always come top of the UK ranking list. So these are the other main materials departments in the country. So Cambridge has always been number one, but Oxford and Imperial College are improving their performance. So uh, we have to be sure that we can continue uh, to uh, succeed. So this, this grade point average is made up of a number of components to do with the, the things which I've, I've shown here. Um, but the thing I'm going to focus on is this thing called the impact template, and in particular, impact case studies, because they are extremely difficult to find. What these are trying to measure are the transition from a basic science discovery through to some, in our case, technological development, and ideally something which has industrial output in the end. So, these case studies, we have to submit four of these, uh, and it was not easy to provide all of the, the chain of, of linkage between the basic science and eventual application. So there is much work in the department which doesn't tick all of the criteria. So uh, they're defined in very qualitative terms, so that the, the breadth of the beneficiaries of the research the idea is that research is publicly funded, so the public should benefit from the research, and the significance, so whether you've really changed the world or people's lives by what you've, you've done. So I'm going, to, I'm going to just briefly show you three of these um, to, to illustrate the range of research which is taking place in the department and how you, uh, how you define what, what is really taking place. So, 
I guess a number of you here will know Harry Badisha, who I know has, has visited several times. So um, let's see whether this works. So his work is on steels, and this, this thing here is uh, an armor plate, which is, has, he has developed, of a special steel alloy. And the advantage is that it's relatively cheap, it's relatively lightweight compared with, uh, with other armor materials. And um, this video goes on a long time, so that it's, it's essentially firing bullets at this, uh, at this armor plate. And uh, the point, point is that it, it's not that it doesn't break, but it, it takes all of the energy out of the ammunition so that uh, it doesn't penetrate into the vehicle that it's trying to protect. So there is some science underlying this. So let's see if I can uh, skip. So this is, this is genuine metallurgy. So the, the, the metallurgy involved was understanding the phase diagrams of, of steel composition sufficiently well that the particular microstructure could be generated by a low temperature uh, annealing process. So in fact, this steel is made at extraordinarily low temperatures by steel standards. This gives it a very, very fine microstructure, and it means that it's, it resists these impacts extremely effectively. And so this is, has worked, was a very successful case study. It is metallurgy. The original papers that reported this, this bainite microstructure were published by Harry Badisha. So the scientific breakthrough was made in a materials department. And there is an industrial application. And you might think that putting armor plate on tanks is, is not a very big industrial application, but it's, it's enough to, to demonstrate that there has been some take up outside the university sector. So here's another one. So uh, Alan Wendell, is a, he's now retired, but he's uh, a senior member of the department. And this is to do with carbon nanotubes. So uh, most of you will be familiar with, with carbon nanotubes as being nanoscale objects made entirely of, of carbon atoms. And this, the, the, again, the particular application here was, was to create uh, fibers made of carbon nanotubes. And so this is the primary paper on which this impact case study was, was made. So this was a science paper, so it's a very important paper. It's been very highly cited. And what the, the group was able to show was that you could create carbon nanotubes in the gas phase for, by injecting catalyst particles into a gas stream in a furnace, and then that you could uh, spin the, the carbon nanotubes into a fiber, also in the gas phase, and then draw them out of the furnace and actually collect them on a spool. So uh, maybe rather like, in a way, a, a spider operates. You, you, you start off with, with something which looks amorphous, but can gradually be pulled together into a fiber. So um, again, there's a, there's a video here. This is, this is a rather simple experiment. So this is the inside of the furnace. Uh, the person is putting a tube inside it. And what you see in here is, is a an amalgam of uh, those fibers, which are being drawn together in this, this rather crude approach to, to, to create uh, a long uh, cable, which can be used for a variety of applications. So when Alan Windle first published this result, the, the key thing that was of importance was the theoretical strength of carbon nanotubes. And you can see this is compared with copper, and this is actually the specific properties. So you divide by the mass. So carbon nanotubes on their own are one of the strongest materials you could possibly make. Um, and indeed, if you measure individual nanotubes, which are the green bars here, they're almost as strong as the theoretical values. The problem is that even once you've spun these into fibers, it's actually the thing which limits their strength is not the individual nanotubes. It's the fact that they can slide over each other and the bonding there is not nearly as strong. So the actual strength of the carbon nanotube fibers turned out to be, in fact, slightly worse than conventional carbon fibers that you might use for, for strengthening composites. 
So this is not a good, even though the application that was reported um, for the impact was based on strength, uh, this is not a good uh, indicator. This is not a material which is going to enter production for these reasons. We can also select, so these materials are metallic, so they conduct electricity quite well. And again, carbon nanotubes theoretically have very low resistivity. But in fact, in practice, again, also because transferring electrons from one fiber to another is difficult, the actual resistance, specific resistance, is less good than copper. So that's also probably not an eventual application. The one that is being focused on now is thermal conductivity. So if you want to create a material which is very light but can uh, conduct a lot of heat away, carbon nanotube fibers look effective. So that's this red bar here. So weight for weight, it is more than 10 times more effective than copper for, for cooling things. So this is a possible application. And this, again, is, is, is certainly material science. The scientific breakthrough was made in our department and published in a science paper. But major industrial applications are still awaited because processing the material into a form that you can use industrially has proved very difficult. So the final uh, thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, gallium nitride uh, light-emitting diodes. And you'll be familiar with, with light-emitting diodes on phones and so on. So uh, gallium nitride was discovered by, or the, the processing of, of LEDs was discovered by a group in Japan uh, 20 years ago. The work in Cambridge has been led by, by Colin Humphreys. And this is the paper which our impact case study was based on. So this seems a not terribly exciting paper. So it is due to do with dislocation reduction in films grown on silicon. And it's not in a particularly prestigious journal. But nevertheless, this was a, a big step forward because in order to make gallium nitride cheap, you have to be able to grow it on a substrate which is also cheap. And most commercial gallium nitride is grown on expensive substrates such as sapphire or silicon carbide. If you could grow it on silicon, you can reduce the production costs significantly. But this has to be a single crystal film. And so the lattice mismatch between silicon and gallium nitride is big. So putting in these different graded compositions as a, as a stack of layers on top of a silicon substrate prevented dislocations from, from entering the final uh, film on top and means that this material here is of electronic device quality. So this is work which has now been commercialized. So Plessy is a UK company which now makes light emitting diodes for lighting applications. So these things here are, are not uh, mercury lamps. These are light emitting diodes. And right down here, you won't be able to read that, but it says Plessy acquired the University of Cambridge spin out CAMGAN in December 2011. So a startup company was, was created in Cambridge that was bought by another company. So we've got uh, the material science done in the material science department in Cambridge. There is an industrial application, but in fact, the primary breakthrough of discovering that gallium nitride could be used to make LEDs was not made in a materials department. It was made in a physics department in Japan. So um, I'm going to talk briefly about the future for materials departments because material science is an increasing field. Everywhere in the world, more and more people are working in the materials sector. And this is, uh, this is part of um, the, the organization that produces the Science Citation Index and so on. So they've pulled together what they call the top 100 material scientists in the world. This is from 2011 because the more recent versions you have to pay for 
and I didn't want to spend money to, to buy this. So these are the top 100 material science departments. So here's a question. How many of the top 100 material science scientists in the world work in a university material science department? Does anyone want to guess? Why? All of them. <laughs> So, okay, so quite a big disagreement there. Um, it's about 15%. So maybe you think it should be smaller or larger than that. But in fact, most of the top ones assessed by this criteria, which is mostly done by citations, work in chemistry departments. So they are fundamentally chemists, but they're doing what they call material science. And we have only one person in that list, so this is Alan Windle. So Alan Windle is number 94 on that list of top 100. So no other member of our department is, is in that list, even Harry Badisha. So it is, it is not a very necessarily a very good definition of material science, but I think it shows that uh, materials although it is a very big sector, the material science which is done in material science departments isn't necessarily recognized as being leading. So here's another indicator. So Nature, as I'm sure you, you know, has a lot of specialist journals. There are Nature Anything is, is more or less now available, but three of the top journals are Nature Chemistry, Nature Physics, and Nature Materials. And this was a very crude test that I did simply by typing search terms into uh, the web of science. But if you look at all of the papers published in Nature Chemistry Journal, 60% of the authors are from a chemistry department. If you look at physics, it's about 50% from a physics department. But if you look at Nature Materials, it's only 25%. So again, you can say that 75% of leading materials research is done not in material science departments. And indeed, if you go back to this, this Science Watch thing, and they claim to have produced a map of the whole of science, in fact, you need to, to look quite carefully, and you realize that material science isn't on that at all. So if you material science, if it exists at all, is going to be somewhere in that space there between sort of physics stuff and chemistry stuff. And again, if you look at physics, there's quite a large amount of that, which I e could equally be interpreted as being material science. So it doesn't include the materials engineering work, which obviously takes place in, to a large extent here, but material science itself is, is buried in many people's minds between physics and chemistry. So this is what we teach. This is the undergraduate structure that we, we have in Cambridge. So Cambridge has a slightly complicated degree structure that, that people studying science do a range of different science subjects in the first. It's quite short and we cover the things you might expect to cover. So the atomic structure of materials, microstructure and mechanical properties and so on. And then as you move through the years, the number of students decreases until we get, uh, so this is the second year again, structure and characterization and so on. And then in, when they study materials full time, they get a wide range of courses. So some examples of ceramics, alloys, crystallography and so on. So we teach them a very standard material science course so they learn about structure, property, relationships, and so on. In part three, they get elective modules which cover more the research interests of the department as a whole. But if we focus on, on the course, and in particular on the material science departments themselves, you could make a few conclusions. That the curriculum that we teach as a material science department has to be rather traditional. We have to be able to educate people to work in, in steels and in other metallic alloys and in composite materials and so on. However, if we're trying to measure the impact of our research, very often the impact comes from basic science discoveries. So 
that those basic science discovery in material science often take place outside material science departments in a physics department or in a chemistry department or in a national laboratory of some sort. So my conclusion, and I gave this, this slide at a, at a material summit earlier this year, and, and most people, I think, felt the same way. The material science department need to broaden the scope of the, of the research that they do so that they can uh, perform not just developmental work to improve the properties of materials, but also the basic research, which leads to genuine scientific breakthroughs. So I'm going to talk for the last uh, 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about my own research, not really because I think I've made any particular scientific breakthroughs, but I'm trying to show the relationship of, of my work to what a potential application would be. So um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I became interested in superconducting. I've worked in superconductors ever since my PhD, but the coupling between superconductivity and ferromagnetism and my interest in that was stimulated by Professor Ryazanov, who is in the audience, and who was the first patient to make an, an electronic device which had a, a ferromagnetic barrier between two superconductors. I'm not going to talk in detail about this because I know many of you will not uh, have had much experience of superconductivity. But this paper, this is uh, the paper which, which led to, to many of the, the programs that I'm currently working on, was published in, again in Science in 2010. And the, the key thing about this, this work was that we found a way of engineering the electron pairs which exist in, in superconductors in such a way that they could freely enter a ferromagnetic system. And in doing so, they could actually carry spin. And spin is an important property of an electron. And many groups around the world have tried to develop electronic technologies based on the spin of an electron. They have generally not succeeded because actually creating a current consisting of spin one spin direction is very energy intensive. So making devices is difficult. The idea that, that, that came out of this paper is that you could create uh, a spin current which could flow in a, in a superconductor which would not dissipate any energy. And so this was the original discovery. And the original result, which was reported in this paper, was that uh, this thing here, which is basically a measure of the, the ability of a supercurrent to flow in a material, if you didn't have this special spacer layer made of the rare earth holmium, decayed exceptionally quickly, many orders of magnitude in a very short thickness of the ferromagnet cobalt. Whereas with this holmium spacer layer, the decay is much slower. So what this means is that, that pairs of electrons which have parallel spins can enter cobalt and continue flowing through comparatively large thicknesses. So this may look like physics, but I would prefer to think of it as material science because this only worked because we understood how to grow these, these layers together. So this is a composite material and it has a interesting electronic properties. So uh, we make these by a process called sputter deposition. So this is a very simple cartoon. So we have one target here which deposits the superconductor. We can then switch to a different target which deposits a ferromagnet and, and so on. And we can deposit a range of different uh, systems in a given deposition so we can compare the properties of, the, of these devices. So this is a top view of one of our bits of kit. It's really small. We're not aiming to make wafers of these materials, just individual chips. And we fabricate these devices using a, a focused ion beam microscope uh, using a technique like this. So this is a completed device here. So this is maybe 200 nanometers by 200 nanometers. And the key thing is that we have the capability within my group not just to grow the materials, but also to make and measure the devices. 
So this is uh, more recent work. So this is a new material. So this gadolinium nitride is, um, is a ferromagnet, but it is also insulating. And there are not very many uh, simple ferromagnetic insulators. So if you make, put an insulator between two metallic or two superconducting materials, you can make what is called a tunnel junction. So electrons have to quantum mechanically tunnel between uh, the two electrodes. These plots here just show that the material is a good ferromagnet. So the magnetization versus applied field reverses at very low field. So it is a good quality material, which we essentially developed. We were able to then show that we could make these tunnel junctions. And so these, this, this current voltage characteristic allows us to tell that what the electronic properties of the material are. We can tell that this three nanometer thick layer of gadolinium nitride is still ferromagnetic. It is still insulating. And the electrons quantum mechanically tunnel from one side to the other. And that's led to a lot of interesting recent developments. So we've shown some interesting basic physical properties. We can show this macroscopic quantum tunneling is real. And why is this important? Well, to convince funding bodies to give me money to work on this, I have to show that there is an eventual application. So. Um, most of you will no doubt use Facebook or some equivalent. So all the pictures that you take that you put on Facebook have to be stored somewhere. So this enormous building is face one of Facebook's data center. It is built near the Arctic Circle in Sweden. And there are two reasons for doing that. One of which is that hydroelectric power in that region is very cheap. This takes 120 megawatts of power to operate. So all of the pictures of cats that you put on Facebook have to go there, and it takes a huge amount of energy to process those images. And the other reason that it's, it's put there is that the average annual temperature is only one degree centigrade. So most of the cost of structures like that is not the semiconductor chips which go inside them. It is actually the air conditioning, the cooling systems, which actually can remove 120 megawatts of, of power. So if you build it in Sweden, where the average temperature is low, your refrigeration costs are correspondingly lower. And the same thing you can, the same argument applies to supercomputers. So again, these dissipate huge amounts of power for the process thing that they deliver. But there are major programs around the world trying to address the, the amount of energy that is used for, for computing is going up very quickly, faster than any other sector. So there is an interest in developing uh, computing which can operate much more efficiently in terms of energy use. And in fact, the way to do this using superconductors has already been known. The basic discoveries of how to make what are called single flux quantum logic circuits were, out, were invented in Moscow uh, maybe 30 years ago. The thing that is missing at the moment is the ability to make cryogenic memory. So the ability to store information in a very small space on one of these, these chips doesn't exist at the moment. The memory cells uh, on a device like this are many microns in size, which is far too big to make uh, uh, an efficient circuit. So the interest in this is that we know how to make cryogenic memory. So this is a paper which we published over 10 years ago. This is the sort of device I just showed you. So the dark blue here is a superconductor. And then these two layers with arrows on are magnetic materials. And the, the, the central point is that depending on the relative magnetization direction of the magnetic layers, you either have uh, a big supercurrent, so that's the, this axis here, you either have a big supercurrent 
or a small supercurrent if the magnetic layers are parallel to each other. So this is a, a memory. If you can uh, change the magnetization direction, then, and it will, it will then stay there, and you can measure either a high critical current or a low critical current. So this is a one-bit memory, which obviously is a long way from a Facebook data center, but it is, it's a start. And this, is, this paper came out actually earlier this week. We've now demonstrated a means by which we can actually use superconductivity to change the direction of these magnetic layers. In this paper, we were using an applied magnetic field to change these magnetization directions. What this paper suggests, at least, is that it's going to be possible to do it electronically. And that's going to be important for an eventual application. So what we're doing, what this paper reported, is there are many electronic ways of coupling magnetic materials together. I'm not going to go into the details. But this superconducting exchange coupling, which I think I've invented, is a method of, of achieving this in such a way that if you change what happens in this, this layer here, you can switch the magnetization directions electronically. So this is what we've already done, what you'd like to be able to, to, to do in the future. You start off with the layers being parallel. You can change the temperature a little bit. That switches, because this becomes a superconductor, that switches to the antiparallel state and that will then stay there. So this is the first step, perhaps, to making a, a superconducting memory. So these, again, are my conclusions. So you've, you've seen these ones before. And the thing, the message I have and the message I've been trying to, to, to give to other heads of materials departments, because we are all in competition. We're in competition with other subjects for undergraduate students. We're in competition with other departments for research funding. And uh, my belief is that material science departments need to have a very strong basic science research program, which can then feed into uh, technical, technological breakthroughs, rather than simply just taking that, rather than taking a physics discovery and engineering it a bit better for eventual applications, because that has much lower impact. It's, it's hard to measure, whereas you can measure the basic research. You can see the original publication. You can see it has thousands of citations, and therefore it's an important piece of work. And that's, um, that's really what I was going to finish on. So. Have to teach. No, they, they have to teach. And because we, are a, because we are a small department, we, we cannot afford not just people that don't teach, but we can't afford to have people that don't teach very well. I, probably you are familiar with professors that have taught you that are, give very bad lectures. And if your lectures are bad enough, then people, the, the, the admin, university administration stop you giving lectures because they're so bad. And that's, that used to be a method by which uh, senior researchers could avoid giving lectures. You just give bad lectures, and then people stop you giving any lectures. We can't afford to let people do that, because we, we have so few faculty members. So we have to recruit people who are really good teachers, people who are really interested in the teaching, as well as in the research. Um, and that's important. But of course, there aren't so many people like that. A lot of people just want to do research. Hello, thank you for your lecture uh, and I have a question. Uh, have you got any cooperation between Cambridge, uh, your, especially your department, and uh, um, other universities maybe in London, never mind? And uh, do you have this cooperation during uh, your experiments and material development? Yes, a, a lot of work is collaborative. Um, in the past, funding from the European Union required you to have partners in, in different European Union countries, which often made for very big consortia. The 
ERC grants that I talked about are awarded to individual, individual investigators, but you can't do this sort of research on your own. You need to collaborate with theorists, people in, in physics and chemistry departments to tell you how to, to create new systems. We collaborate quite strongly, but we, we want to retain the core of our activity within Cambridge. So the, I showed you the gallium nitride work on LEDs. The center of that is the fact that we can grow the material. We have industrial scale MOCVD reactors. We can then give material to collaborators who can then study it in different ways. But it means that the materials department in Cambridge is central to all of the work which takes place in the UK. And a similar argument applies to the superconductor work that I'm talking about. We have collaborators, but we make the materials and we make the devices. presentation and uh, as a head of department we definitely know the answer to my question. Uh, how to make material science attractive for prospective students? We don't, yeah, we don't have that. Maybe, that. maybe 10 years ago that used to be a problem. Um, it's, we don't totally understand it, but certainly material science in the UK for undergraduates is becoming increasingly popular. Um, I think it's partly to do with um, high-tech companies like Apple that, that clearly you can recognize that a lot of the developments that they've made have, have been to do with exploiting new materials which are available. Um, there is a large racing car industry which is based in, in the UK, so even Ferrari do a lot of their build their cars for racing cars in the UK. And it's, that's recognized as sort of high performance materials are interesting to, to, to school kids. But we have an advantage in Cambridge is that people don't have to choose which science subject they want to study till they have had one year in university. So provided they've chosen the option to do materials in the first year, and 250 students do that now, we have the first year to convince them that materials is really interesting and an increasing number of now choose it to the, to the point that we, we can now choose. We, we, we can select only the best students to continue to do material science. But we don't fully understand it. We, it's, it's, it's difficult. We try and get feedback, but, but people like the way we teach it and they like the subject as a whole. Is it working? Okay. I, that's a good question. I, we have not. We have um, the scientists that, that have, have worked on that project want to continue doing basic research and not move to companies. And in fact, it has happened the opposite way, that, that some of the, the leading industrial scientists in those companies have moved into the university on um, what are called industrial fellowships. So they, they want to take time away from their company to do basic research, to understand longer term problems which, which are affecting the application of the materials. Within the company, they can only do really short-term research. By moving to university, they can maybe do research which might deliver a result in five years rather than one year. So although people, a lot of our postdocs and, and PhD students leave to work in industry, once, once a person enters the academic system in the UK, they tend to stay there. Здесь речь идет только о научных интересах ученых, которые работают там в компании, а 
финансово получается примерно одинаково, что я говорю в компании, что в университете. Правильно? Yes, I mean, it, probably university salaries are not so high, probably as industrial salaries, but um, you work in a different environment and maybe it is a more rewarding thing to do. I, people, in some ways, prefer that. Sure. <laughs> Я занимаюсь затвердеванием, и он слышал, что есть исследования, которые, по которым сверхпроводимость обеспечивает, э, обеспечивает определенное затвердевание металлических расплавов. А, занимаюсь ли вот в вашем университете затвердеванием, в частности, для придания сверхпроводимости материала? Скажите, пожалуйста. I, personally, I do not, because I work only on thin film materials which are directly deposited. Um, there is, uh, elsewhere in the university, there is a, a big program on bulk superconductors, and the main application is, in fact, for magnetic bearings to replace ball bearings. Um, and their solidification is really important because the microstructure the control of the microstructure is essential to get very high performance. For the work I do, it is solidification in a sense, but it is just condensation from a, from a vapor to, to the solid uh, with some control of the properties, but, but not very much. And the last question, please. For the направление material, more or less, from your report, it's clear, but I would like to hear your opinion. В металлургии, металлургия, в ней есть какие-то наиболее перспективные направления, которыми сейчас э, ну, следует заниматься студентом и ученым, по вашему мнению, или металлургия уже отходит на второй план, и в общем, она никаких ключевых решений не способна принести. В общем. Yeah, that's a good question. It's, um, as I came, my first degree is physics, but I did a materials PhD. And I guess when I first joined the materials department, I took the view that, that all research in metallurgy must have been done in the 1950s, and that there was nothing yet, nothing left to discover. Um, but as I've become embedded in the department, and particularly since I became head of department, I recognize there, there, is, there is a huge amount still to do, um, particularly for advanced applications that, that it's to do with, with making materials lighter, it's making them withstand higher temperatures and so on. The question of whether that's really basic research I think is a, is a good question, but uh, because it's certainly, it is probably almost impossible to get a paper about steels published in Nature Materials but that doesn't, that doesn't make it unimportant research, but it does mean that it doesn't necessarily have very high impact. <laughs>